Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to today's session, Reboot Your Business Through Your Business Development Plan from Griffith College, Dublin, Cork and Limerick in association with Chambers Ireland. Welcome to all the businesses who are joining us again this morning. We really appreciate you coming uh, along with us on the journey and um, those businesses that are members of Chambers Ireland and other SMEs throughout the country. We do invite you to engage on social media using the hashtag Reboot2020. Follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and look out for the stories. We love to see your posts and we do share those and encourage your engagement throughout. On the website, on the Griffith website, you'll also see a link to resources on the course page. So all of the resources from all of the sessions, the different topics that we've been covering throughout will be on that page, including the slides, the bios from the speakers, and information for how to contact myself and Geraldine, who are the course coordinators for this programme. We have a great lineup for you today and um, hope that you enjoy the session. We do invite Q&A throughout. The Q&A button is located at the bottom of the screen and uh, you can submit your questions there and we'll take them later on in the session. Um, my name is Michael Bosnay, and I'd like to hand over now to my colleague, Sean Martin from Griffith College, Dublin, um, who will bring you through today's session and introduce our speakers. So thank you very much and enjoy today's session. Good morning, all. You're very welcome. And thank you, Michael. Uh, this morning, um, I just, well, firstly, I'd just like to remind you to, that you have your workbooks at ready and to take down any notes or thoughts that may actually arise as you listen to the speakers. This morning, I'm actually delighted and honored to basically introduce to you two speakers who have one thing in common, which is basically a vast amount of knowledge and experience, which they've kindly offered to share with us all this morning. The first person I'd like to introduce you to is our keynote speaker, uh, Vicky O'Toole. Vicky is the owner and managing director of JJ O'Toole Limited in Limerick. And basically, um, JJ O'Toole designs and supplies packaging to many industrial sectors throughout the country, including um, retail, hospitality, hygiene, and food and drink. Vicky herself has been, has received many business awards, the most recent of which has been, she was a finalist in the 2018 EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Second, our second speaker, um, who's going to act as facilitator this morning, is John Early of Griffith College's Law Faculty. John is the Programme Director for our Honours Law Degree Programme, which includes both full-time and part-time learners. Previously, as a barrister, John had a general practice that involves specialization in employment law and industrial relations. He is widely published in his field and he has contributed to many conferences and programs, including with the King's Inns and the Law Society of Ireland. So therefore, without further ado, I'd like you to hand over to John who will facilitate this morning's proceedings. Thanks. I'm just waiting for my video to be um, yeah, started there. I think everyone can see me now. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we're delighted to be here this morning um, to uh, have such a wonderful keynote speaker, Vicky O'Toole, who I think everyone will find to be not only hugely experienced, but hugely inspirational uh, in terms of her approach and the um, information that she will provide us uh, this morning. Just to give a run through or just to set the scene for some of the issues we might look at uh, in this session, I'm just going to share Share a very brief PowerPoint presentation um, uh, just in terms of, I suppose, not only the information we're going to be looking at today, but also in terms of JJ O'Toole and Vicky O'Toole and the heritage which, which she brings to the seminar uh, this morning. So um, essentially, as I'll just uh, start my um, screen save here. Um, just as Sean has mentioned, today's seminar is entitled How to Protect My Business and the People I Work With. And um, it's myself and Vicky. Now, in terms of 
just a very uh, a wonderful little presentation here in terms of the timeline of JGO2. And I think, uh, and uh, I think we might start at the, uh, in our conversation after this, just maybe starting with this, because it really brings home to um, our, our attendees this morning, just uh, in terms of a business, whether you're large or small business, the amount of challenges and events that you really meet in your in, in, in your in your experiences as you progress and you can see with JGO tool they've really there's nothing really they haven't come through whether it's uh, war financial recession and now this pandemic so um, that's something I'd look forward to exploring in terms of the themes and the resilience it builds um, as we start our conversation. Um, essentially, the, the tone and, and the focus of today's seminar will be really about managing change successfully. Um, that's what really we're here for. And as I said, the issues that we were looking at will, uh, you know, whether you're a small business or a large business, uh, every business started small. So the issues that we're looking at will really be relevant to everyone, uh, regardless of the scale or size of their, uh, their business. And, you know, we'll be covering a range of uh, issues and, uh, and, and I suppose topics that are particularly relevant, ranging from cash flow to you know um, how to deal with customers and all of that type of thing um, so in, in terms of themes um, positivity and resilience creativity and imagination um, communication also is hugely important um, uh, and also reorganize and diversify. Now, again, just as Sean pointed out at the start, um, you, you know, uh, my background would be from an HR and a legal side. So just in terms of uh, that side of things, you know, there are various teams that will be very much relevant to the business side as well. And which I suppose Vicky will explain in a much more real world hands-on way um, in terms of, you know, how as a person in business, she has uh, dealt with those issues in practice. Um, again, with terms of the landscape, just in terms, I suppose, of the, the seminar this morning, the business plan, Obviously, there are, I suppose, two parts to it. There's issues around what are internal to the business, and that would include, you know, issues around employees and really relationships within the structure of the business itself. And then secondly, external to the business, and that would be issues around customers, suppliers, and other business relationships. Um, so um, in terms of internal to the business and employee relations, um, you know, uh, there's a number of checklists. So I suppose it, uh, from a HR side, just in terms of pitfalls, Falls and navigating the, the landscape. Um, issues in terms of change that HR law would look at would be things like the purpose of the business or the place of the business. So restructuring and, and I suppose HR uh, validated and HR acceptable change relates to things like that. You know, you can look at things like the purpose of the business, the place of the business in terms of navigating the terrain. Um, Equally, then, uh, the type of work within uh, a, a business. Clearly, you know, there might be reorganization required. There may be some types of work or roles going forward that really maybe no longer are necessary. Again, HR and the law would kind of uh, look at that as an acceptable structure of uh, within reorganization. Again, roles within the business. Now, the last slide looked at work, but this is more about roles, like as in particular roles within the structure. So again, in terms of implementing positive change, and again, when we get uh, in terms of our conversation with uh, Vicky, we'll see that a huge element of this is really about trust and communication and things around consultation in terms of a business plan and you know at what point should you bring in the employees to consultation um you know what types of employees maybe should be brought in to the consultation process and at what point um exploring options again these these um i suppose headings or these issues would be very much an overlap between hr and business or hr and the financial side in terms of exploring the options in terms of uh you know before you make decisions about employees have you explored the options that are available to you as a business. Strong foundations then, um, essentially in terms of the plan, in terms of the criteria you've come up with, in terms of the business plan, your research, all of those issues, and then application. And uh, obviously then decisions that are made on foot of that and communication. Um, and then uh, secondly, then in terms of the external relationships that would clearly include things like customers, lending institutions and uh, suppliers. So um, that's basically the terrain we're in for today. And uh, we hope to cover some of those teams um, as we go through our conversation. So um, if I might uh, start now, I think Vicky is there uh, ready to come in. Um, we might start our conversation. Um, uh, yep, uh, yep, 
Good morning, John. Oh, good morning, uh, Vicky. Uh, I, I just setting the scene for you there as you uh, mm -hmm. as, as you walk on the, on, on the stage. Um, essentially, I suppose we might just start with that um, slide I talked about in terms of your your heritage as a business and the and I suppose the the challenges that you faced throughout that long history and really I suppose the learning that I suppose that instills in you and uh, that heritage you're aware of uh, would that be something you're conscious of um, uh, in your in your role? Oh John very conscious of it I mean as I sit here in my office um, I if people can see there's the three generations behind me that they, they were the three generations that preceded me. So there is always that reminder of, uh, particularly they're, they're all passed away now, unfortunately, but um, either the mantle is big for me to look after the company and make sure that it, 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 you know, we continue on for the next generation. But I think I've actually drawn the short straw because if you look at the timeline, I, I was introduced to the company in 2002 when we, when we had the bag tax and we were losing so much money. Um, like we lost 40% of, or turnover literally overnight. And now uh, with COVID-19, here we go again, but actually it is an awful lot worse. So I don't know how they, you know, obviously I wasn't, I'm not old enough to know what happened, you know, when the company was was fighting with the, or had to live through World War One, World War Two, but I was around for the plastic bag tax in 2002. That's when I was introduced to the company. So it's actually, we all do different things, obviously, along the way, all the different generations. But I think I did draw the short straw because I've had two in a row now. And um, it, so it's it's been quite difficult. But I think our longevity has certainly stood to us. You know, having a name that has lasted, a brand name and packaging that is 106 years old. So and I think positivity and definitely passion. There is no question about it. I mean, not giving up. So we we're reinventing ourselves again. It's amazing. This must be about the fifth or sixth time that this company has actually reinvented itself at different times in the last over the last century. So yeah, I'm 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 not giving up. And um I've had lots of ideas since March when this all kicked off. And um thankfully some of them are working, which we can talk about later on. But yeah, no, there's a lot of pressure, there's no question about it, particularly when you have a company as old as this one and um you don't want anything to happen to it and you particularly don't want anything to happen to your colleagues and that's the most important thing and to our clients it's so important that we stay open for them they're relying on us to stay open so yeah long days working very hard for the moment thinking outside the box um have a few ideas that we can share maybe later on with with the viewers but yeah uh, yeah uh, no pressure <laughs> I mean, really. Absolutely. And we were just saying before we started that you were just commenting about the, the resilience and I suppose the, the sense of being rooted in, in the locality at the moment in, in Limerick and how I suppose that's a, a way of people looking after each other, reminding each other. Is that something that you're conscious of as well as a way, particularly maybe for small businesses supporting each other at, at the moment? It's huge. It is absolutely huge. I just, there are so many positives about COVID-19. I mean, I mean, we're all focusing on the negatives, but there are so many positives. And what's happening in the community here in Limerick is extraordinary. And I've no doubt it's happening all across the country. But small things, like you know, our, our, we've, we've a, there's a local petrol station, Barons, you know, they're following us on Instagram, you know, posting things up about us. We're doing it for them. We're helping them out. But small little businesses, like we, there's a seamstress that we I go to occasionally in Limerick she contacted me recently to say that there was a dentist in Limerick that wanted her to, she obviously has no business for the moment, wanted her to make some uniforms, you know, for, scrubs for the, for the dentist. They couldn't open unless they got them. So she contacted me to know to be of craft paper. Obviously we do. I give it to her free of charge. It didn't mean it make any difference to me. And she's now making outfits, uniforms for dentists and they're now opening. And it's all this community spirit it is absolutely extraordinary. And I really do hope and pray that this is something that's going to continue when we get out the other end of this. I mean, I'm hoping that the new normal is going to bring all of this with it, because it is so amazing when people have each other's backs. Now, we're, we're an SME company. I mean, people think that we're much bigger because we're around so long and because we've a lot of very big blue chip retailers. But we are an SME. And it is so nice to see the support. And I love supporting companies that are smaller than us as well. You know, giving a little bit of experience that we have and helping out. There is a really good feeling about helping out. There's no question about it. Um, so I hope it continues.
Absolutely. And I suppose that leads us nicely then into, I think, something else that you're quite passionate about and something that you're, I suppose, personally very involved in. And it's this idea of diversification and creativity. And you mentioned it yourself in terms of, I suppose, reimagining the business or, or, or the, the business kind of developing different sort of, uh, uh, I suppose, shapes and sizes as, as, as it goes through the years. Um, and you mentioned there just how that's happening almost organically on the ground. I mean, in terms of your own experience and how you're managing at the moment, is that something that's taking up a focus on your side? You know, the, I think that the short answer to that is that when 17 of our 25 colleagues are not working for the moment, we're on temporary leave. And when 17 of them, those 17 come back, I think that they will find the company nearly unrecognisable. That's how quickly things are changing here. And it is actually, isn't it amazing that after 106 years, we're still changing. And this pause button that we've been given, in a way for me, has been a fantastic opportunity to relook at the company. I thought that some of us that were working would actually be at home and spending time wondering what we're going to do with ourselves. I don't have enough time with all the new ideas that are coming up, relooking at all the processes and procedures, changing things as we're going along, coming up with new ideas, creative ideas. Simple things like we've changed the logo. You know, I, I think most people will have seen what all the big brands have been doing, like McDonald's with their social distancing logo. And I decided, okay, well, we're, you know, we're not McDonald's, we're far from it, but we're a very old brand. So I got our JTO2 brand, looking at the two J's, and I said, let's turn one J around the other way, you know, so that they're looking apart from each other. And we've been using that a lot on our website and our social media. And I, I think I've lost it to be quite honest with you, because I have with my lawnmower cut out two, those two J's and my lawnmower and put it up on, on LinkedIn and, and social media, Instagram, which I really don't do, but now I have to do it because our marketing girl is not working, but um, my colleague. So we're getting massive uh, uh, traction for that. But also we're working on our website in the background and we're now doing something I never thought we would ever be able to do. And that is giving our customers the the opportunity of buying bespoke packaging online. I thought we could never do it, but we can do it. Obviously, we can't give them all the options, but we're testing that out. But we're testing so many different things out, and we're also re-looking at our credit terms. We're looking at the, at, at, at the, the script or the text on our performer invoices, on, on everything, actually everything. And they're all the things that we never really had time to look at because we were all so busy running around the place. And, you know, it is important to pause. It really, really is. And we, even though we're busy now, I am using this time to relook at every single facet of the company and where we can get, we, where we can do better. But we've also discovered um, that we now have, we were selling new products to new clients, which is just such a positive. It's funny because when, anytime I've been interviewed on the radio or for anything, it usually starts off with the line, Vicky, so the company lost 40% of its business overnight and you nearly closed down. That's usually the intro to the story. Um, and that's exactly the truth. But with COVID-19, and I, it's extraordinary, I was presuming that we would lose 98% of our business overnight because 98% of our business would be, a lot of it would be bespoke for customers, you know, like Grand Thomas, Kenny, et cetera. They're not open, so they wouldn't be ordering the, their packaging. And I don't know, I was speaking to our finance director recently and she was saying, Vicky, you know, we're only 75, I, you know, she said we're 75% down. And I said, gosh, isn't that great? And she said, why are you so positive? And I said, wouldn't it be worse if it was 98%? And then I was looking at our sales yesterday and we're now 50% down. So it's, it's growing and growing and growing. And that's extraordinary considering most of what we normally do is not moving out of our warehouse. And the reason that our sales are not as bad as I think, thought they were going to be is because I found new niches. We're now selling a lot of PPE packaging and e-commerce packaging. We cannot keep it in our warehouse. You know, it, it's out the, the second it comes in. Now, the, the reason we got into PPE packaging is that I started at the very beginning. I could see what was coming down the road and with China and the COVID-19, and I could see it moving over here. So we, I asked our manufacturers, who obviously don't manufacture face masks, would they give me a gift of face masks to donate to charities. And they all went out and got them. We air freighted them in and we give them to Barnardos, et cetera. Um, and then we discovered that there were lots of people looking for them. So we then re engaged with manufacturers around the world for face masks. And we all, we do gloves, but then we're now selling a huge amount of gloves. 
we're doing aprons, we, which we did before, but we're also doing lots of PPE packaging we never did before, which is great. It's a positive for us. And the e-commerce packaging, which we did a lot of, we're now doing an awful lot more of. And as a result of that, I can see positives as well, because now we have new customers we didn't deal with before that are buying from us, who hopefully will be our clients forever, you know, going forward when we open up again. So all of those kind of things have been great, but it, it's it's also the way we're we're talking to each other, we're we're dealing with each other, we're meeting on um we're on computers now, you know, we're doing this Teams meeting, Microsoft. I think that's working great. I'm looking also at the way that we will be dealing, you know, we'll be working. I, I don't think everybody needs to be in the office. I'm quite enjoying working from home, albeit I have now, of my five children, four of them are now back living at home and we have Wi-Fi issues and they're all set up offices in different rooms and one is studying upstairs. But if it suits my colleagues to work from home, I'm very happy with that, really happy with that. So the, the amount of positives that we can take out of this are incredible for the business, for ourselves personally, for our colleagues, for our clients. I think it's, it, I, I just think it's great. Now, obviously, there's a really bad side to COVID-19 and people getting sick and, you know, the, the worry of that. But I think if we are social distancing properly, um, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I think we can look back and say that wasn't a great time, but we bring we brought a lot of positives out of it. You know, mentally, personally, business wise, the whole the, the, the whole thing. I, I think it, we need to use it as a positive. And as, as a, questions, I think I went off on a bit of a tangent there. Not at, no, not at all. And I think that just follows on as well. Um, I, I obviously coming to this seminar, I was looking into your 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 journey and 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 your background. And I suppose one of the things that strikes me, and I suppose I'm putting words in your mouth, is uh, um, you like just I suppose you were kind of almost an accidental. Uh, managing director in the sense that you've you sort of came to it you found yourself in a situation and I suppose the, I suppose from somebody maybe as an outsider maybe to some degree um to what extent do you think you seem to be someone that kind of acts from your instinct and from your intuition in, in some business decisions do you think that is a good way to, is, is that a, a kind of a positive way to do it compared to maybe you know market research and waiting and procrastinating I mean as at the moment we're in a pandemic that was completely unforeseen so um, it, from your perspective, um, in terms of the qualities that anyone can bring to, to that kind of reaction, do you think even, you know, smaller business people or, or people that are, you know, finding themselves in that similar situation can equally look at diversifying in that manner that you're talking about there? I, I think everybody can do it. I mean, I didn't go to, I didn't go to business school. I mean, and like there is no business school that could teach you what's happening for the moment, what to do. There's no book on COVID-19. We're all going on our gut feeling are the information that we're getting from the government and what to do and the, the HSC directives as to, you know, social distancing and what we need to do. Like, who, who, know, who knows? I guess six months ago, nobody knew where we were going to be today. And nobody knows where we're going to be in six months time. So we have to go on our gut feeling. Absolutely. And I'm, I, I've, I'm changing my mind every two minutes as well. I mean, this is not, you know, there's a light bulb moment. I said, oh, here we go. Every single day we're thinking of things and something crops up and I think maybe we should do this. And even, for instance, with, with our colleagues. So when we started off, there were five or six of us working full time. We then had to think recently, our warehouse was getting quite busy again. We need to bring in somebody else from the warehouse. And it was suggested to me, we bring in somebody that was only here a couple of years because he's able to drive the van and, you know, he would be able to do some of the deliveries. And then somebody said, no, we need to bring in the, the, the person, the individual who's been here for 26 years. I don't go on longevity, who's been here the longest. We're going on the skill set that actually suits what's happening today. So, but there was, I was going to go with somebody and then I said, no, no, I think I'll, I'll ask, you know, Jason to come instead of Andrew or maybe, so like, there's, we, we have to kind of mull over it ourselves and not everything is going to work first time. You know, you're going to come up with something, a decision, and then you kind of think, oh no, I need to change that. So it's kind of touch and feel. And it very much is gut feeling, I think. and. I don't know, you're listening to the news and you listen to, the, I think the government is doing a great job for the moment, but they are, this is all new to them as well. And everybody really is in a situation that nobody ever dreamt ever it would happen to us. But I think that everybody can come up with an idea and try something new. And you know what, what's wrong with trying something new? 
I mean, if you fail, you fail. I mean, it's better than my thing in life is that I, you know, I, I have a fear of failure. Failure. I think that's what drives me. And it's not a fear, a fear of failure for myself, but it's a fear of failure for my colleagues, my children, my five children. Um, and also it's, it, it's, it's, I have a fear of regrets. I, I have one or two big regrets in my life. A, I didn't finish university. Um, I was studying law. I actually didn't like it, but I kind of wish I was mature enough to actually have finished it. And yet I have two children now that are solicitors, but are one yearly. I don't want to have a regret and I don't want to not try my best. I don't mind failing if I put in 150%. And I can say to my colleagues, put my hand up and say, listen, you know what? I've actually tried my absolute best. I don't want to be at home sitting there and kind of saying, well, you know, I will kind of read a book and this will all go away. And then when I come back out, but, you know, hopefully everything will be better. And actually what's ironic about all of this is at the beginning, I signed up to two courses. One was I was going to learn the, to play the piano during this. And another one I was going to perfect writing because when I do retire, I want to write a book. I've had no time for either of those, none of them. So, but it's, I think you need to try new things and look outside the box and see what ca else can I do and even if you can think of a new idea or a new product that you can sell or a new way of selling your product is what can you do internally about helping your colleagues when they do come back in, you know, improving a system, we looking at it. And like I was only thinking this morning, outside our building, and this building is 20 years old, so it was built before I started. And you have a huge sign, J202 Limited, paper and plastic. It is mortifying that we still have that word plastic outside our building that's how much our business has evolved because now it's all about eco-friendly packaging which i'm passionate about so things move we we either make them change or things change things for us so i, I like to be one of those people that do change things and i think it's that kind of maybe entrepreneurial entrepreneurship thing that maybe we have that we can find ways of getting out of things i think that's probably what it is and when I was shortlisted or was a finalist in the Entrepreneur of the Year 2018, no idea how they picked me. I really don't. And I actually had to Google up what was an entrepreneur. And the thing that came up was it is somebody who falls off the cliff, off a cliff, but builds an airplane on the way down. And I must have built a little airplane on the way down, a paper airplane, I would imagine what it was. But it, it's, I, I think we're, we're always looking for a way, even though we don't realize it, of getting out of a fix that we've been stuck into. Or, you know, and it's not all about, success is not about making money, 150%. Success is about just getting through things, getting over the humps and the bumps. Because if, if, if success means making money, then I'm not successful. Success to me is keeping this business going, keeping my colleagues with jobs, making sure all the, that their families are all okay, my four kids are okay, and, and just, you know, that those happy days that you, you get a thank you. And like that to me is success. I used to play golf a long, long time ago. Um, and I, it's only now that I've given up after seven years or 10 years, I actually now realize I'm actually a good golfer. But anybody out there who's listening and golfs, you will know what I mean by this. I used to play off 11.7, technically 12. And I could be re go out and have the worst game of golf ever. And then I would be hitting my last shot onto the 18th and it would be a magnificent shot. And it was that one shot that would make you go back out again. And that's what happens in business. You have 200, could have 200 bad days in a row. And then you have a magnificent day where you get a huge order or self just buy something from us or I designed something that I didn't even know I could design. And you go, yeah, that was worth it. That to me is success. And that thank you from somebody who appreciates what you've actually done for them. If it's a colleague, if it's a client, if it's anybody. That's what success means. And I think everybody can, if they can latch on to that, it makes such a difference. Absolutely. And uh, again, I, I think in terms of, um, I suppose, our discussions about, uh, I suppose, the, the themes of today, another, I think, that struck me um, as something important, and it wouldn't maybe have been something that struck me originally as, an, as, as important as it is, but it's this idea of communication uh, within the business in terms of you know, as you mentioned there, reintegrating staff, um, you know, after this is, uh, after this is over or as we reopen and, and managing those expectations and, you know, communication, I think, and I think another thing that struck
struck me um, as something people are suffering from is communication between uh, from customers or between business and customer. Um, how do you see that uh, unfolding at the moment, both, I suppose, towards employees and then maybe looking at it from the customer perspective? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big one for the moment. It certainly is. And, you know, at the start of this, when you, when I was speaking to you earlier or last week, John, you kind of mentioned we might be talking about things like HR. I'm going, no, please, no. Um, now, because we're a small SME company, I'm, I speak to my colleagues literally every day. I know the names of their children. I know everything. So we have some colleagues that have been with us for over 30 years. Uh, some of them that are not there that long. But we, I'm in communication with them every two weeks particularly those that are not here, that are on temporary leave, I send them an email and I'm here if they want to ring me up and I can see the difference between some of them. Some of them are getting on fine. Some of them are not getting on fine. You have some that are living on their own or they're now kind of painting their house for the second time. They have nobody to talk to. You have others that are living at home with young children, some that are working with young children, which I don't know how they do it. I really do not know because my five children are not young anymore and I'm finding it difficult living with them and I don't have to do homeschooling. But so you, the, the, there's different types of, you know, some people are anxious, they want to get back. Some people I think are getting on fine because, they, you know, they're doing their garden or they're, 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 they're learning how to play the piano or something like that. But they're all very anxious to get back to normality, a Monday to Friday, you know, a kind of regime. I understand that. I'm also very conscious of the my colleagues who I'm working with remotely who are finding it quite stressful uh, at times just like I am because we just can't keep up with everything that we have to do and you know we're multitasking doing two or three people's jobs at the same time and absolutely withered on a Friday night so there's all of that and then there are the clients and the suppliers so we are the, we're the middleman so we were, we're dealing with China and India and Europe in the UK Turkey up the road and it, it's extraordinary with, with actually manufacturers because when this all started off, China shut down and then we're having a panic attack as to, you know, well, not quite, but how are we going to get supply for some of our customers? So we were reaching out to other countries, other you know continents to, to get supply in uh, Europe, for instance, and then they shut down. So back to China again. But you can see some of the customers are very calm and they're very collective. And they're, they're all absolutely fine. And then you can see the clients and you can read between the lines, listen to it, read between the sentences on the phone as well. Some of them are very, very upset. Some of them are very, very worried. Some of them are very, very nervous about business. Will they be there in six months time? Will they be there in two years time? And I think it's about how you deal with it. I think being calm is the most important thing. I mean, there is just absolutely no point in panicking now because I, I think that most of us will survive. I think if we work together, and I do mean work together. So at the very start of this, we sent out an email to most of our clients, um, you know, particularly those that owed us money. I mean, they all got, an, you know, that we would work. Could we work together? Because obviously my, my manufacturing partners are sending me exactly the same emails. And unless our clients work with us and we work with our manufacturers, somebody is going to fall along the wayside. So obviously we um, we have uh, most of our, our clients are have engaged with us because we'd have a lot of printed stock sitting out in our warehouse on paper. Um, and but you do see one or two that are kind of you think, OK, they're taking this very seriously and maybe their tone is not great. <laughs> you know, as all I can say is they're quite cross. They're quite, you know, I, I suppose without saying too much, I think the word respect has to be thought about a lot here you need to treat each other with respect and I do absolutely demand that I have to say and you know it was only yesterday that one of my colleagues who's been work with working with, with me side by side for 15 years rang me very upset she got an appalling email from from a, a customer not a very old client of ours but um not a happy person and kind of decided he would take it out on her and it was really uncalled for. I mean, you know, there's no point in having in taking it out on somebody else. You know, we're here to help and we absolutely are helping. But also, I think people need to remember that we we have to pay people as well. And we're not a bank, um, even though people think we are. And, and you can see the cream rising to the top. I have to say you absolutely can see the cream rising to the top. And I think when we get out of this, you know, you know the expression that people buy from people they like. And I think also, I think people also sell to people they like as well. 
you know, we do we do need to be respected. And and I I, I my clients, we re, I respect them hugely, and I know they respect us 99.999% of them. My colleagues, we we respect each other. There has to be respect. Once you lose respect, I think you have a problem. And I think it's important that everybody remembers that if you're having a bad day, you know, maybe not remember what you, you just maybe walk away for 10, 15 minutes and, and have a think about where you are. And, you know, because it's, it's the words can be lasting forever. You know, you, you know, you, and particularly if you're writing things down in email, you need to be so careful what you're writing to people right now, because it will be remembered. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think uh, one of the things that struck me as well, um, listening to you was um, the issue around your contracts generally and exploring terms and conditions that you may need to change going forward uh, in response to this whole era. Is that something you've been looking at as well um, as part of your overall restructuring or development at the moment? Yeah, we're changing everything. We're literally changing everything. It's extraordinary. You, and I'm sure there's viewers listening and thinking, you know, 160, 106 years old, they must have had that all nailed by now, you know, terms and conditions. We haven't, I thought we did, but you're running around all the time and you, you know, you did them maybe five years ago and you think they're fine. And then you're looking at them now and you think, you know, they're not fine. So our perform invoices have been changed. Our order forms have been changed. I'm doing them all with, with, our, with my, with, with our finance director. Uh, we're, we're looking at absolutely everything because we've seen gaps. We've seen holes where we can get into trouble. It's it's so important that they're right. It's it really really is. But we're doing it slowly but slowly. We have um we have a drive in the company here where there's a drive in, and on our drive it's shared drive. So we've it's called a global drive. So everybody in the company, all our colleagues, can look at it. So we've all you know the employee handbook. We've everything on that. That's been changed now as well. So that everything that's allowed to be looked at by everybody is on that. Then we have the finance drive, we have the design drive, we have all those. So they're all being changed now as well. We're updating them all the time. We're updating our terms and conditions on the website. Everywhere, because also I've been noticing that things weren't in sync. So we might have one terms and condition, like one rule of one, and then there's something different than something else. So I want to sync everything so that when everybody comes back, everybody knows that everything is exactly the same. And that all the orders that we get, that every customer knows exactly what the terms and conditions are. Every supplier that we put a PO on with knows what the terms and conditions are. All the four main voices. And like everybody knows that we just, like, I don't know, maybe not everybody, but I hate all of that. I absolutely, you know, it brings you back to when I was studying my one year of law in UCC, you know, all that reading and checking. And I much prefer to be creative and working on designs and much better fun. I mean, much better fun. But it has to be done and it's been done now. And so, yeah, I'm happy to get that done. So it's it's important, you know, that's all those processes and procedures, all the rules and regulations, all the T's being crossed, all the I's being dotted. It's all endless, to be honest with you. But yes. And so that's why before everybody starts here, they're going to be if, if it's within their department, they have to learn and, you know, no, they have to be rehearsed on it before they start, because there's no point in one person being in purchasing doing one thing and somebody else in purchasing department doing another thing and then somebody in finance doing something else. We all have to be singing off the same hymn sheet. And if any, if we're going to be changing the terms and conditions for any particular reason, it has to be signed off by either Margaret, my head of finance or myself. Because I think we were getting a little bit lax along the way and we weren't checking everything. I mean, you're too busy to check everything. But if there's one rule for everybody now, that's the rule we're going forward with. And if anybody wants to bend it slightly, they'll have to come to Margaret and myself. So it's, um, yeah, no, that's been a positive, you know, now that we're kind of nearly finished it, it's, it's, you know, one of the hardest, you know, it's often when you have to do something, you don't really want to do it. And then you kind of get to the end of it and you're going, yes, thank God. So yeah, we've done it nearly. Yeah. And, and just as, a, just as, a, as a, I suppose, an interest in, in that regard, uh, how do you communicate that to your customers then when you say, well, look, we've, re re we've reviewed our terms and conditions, we've updated them. Um, is that something you ever feel you get kickback on or do you feel maybe that you might be negativity around that or, you know, pulling together and this idea of, of looking after each other? Do you think that'll influence, um, you know, customers as well, I suppose? Well, we, we tested actually one of them out yesterday which was quite interesting. So you wouldn't believe this, like even though, like you may, you may do, but I still hear from some of the sales reps, no, Vicky, you know, when 
when your husband Fergus was running the business, this is what he did. And, you know, somebody has to say, but his dad used to do this and that were the rules and terms and conditions. And I said, guys, seriously, you know, we're 2020 now, we've got to move with the times. So I I was, I heard yesterday from, from one of my colleagues that, you know, some of the, the payment, the credit terms for one of our customers that we've been with for long, has been with us for a very long time. We're very lucky that we seem to retain customers for a long time, that they were paying us at the, the deal that was done, that was cut back in, I think, you know, 20 years ago was credit terms of 90 days. And, you know, the sales rep was kind of saying to me, Vicky, you know, they won't order from us again if I try and rein them to, you know, 30 days net, which is supposed to be. And I said, well, Lindsay, why don't you explain to them, you know, what the company term, credit terms are, you know, because we pay for our goods before a lot of them come in. So, you know, we're not, we, we, we couldn't, in, particularly in the future, we can't, we can't continue with that. So I just had to explain to them how we do business, what we, what the processes are. They came back absolutely no problem when it was explained to them properly. So there would be a bit of that. And I think if somebody doesn't understand, like if somebody thinks that they can pay us in 120 days and we've already paid for the goods well in advance, it's coming from the far east to wherever, like they will have to move elsewhere, you know, because we're not a bank, you know, and giving, you know, credit-free loans. Or look, we, we couldn't do that. Interest-free loans, should I say, but... So yeah, no, it's it's kind of testing the waters really and changing things, but it's trying to get everything in, in sync now. And that you know, we're all saying, and as I said earlier, we're all saying off the same hymn sheet. But I also do think that COVID-19 is going to be um it's 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 people are seeing how difficult it is themselves, you know, to keep businesses open. That I'm hoping that they will understand that we all have the same issues, that it's not just them, it's us, it's everybody. There's very few industries, very few retailers that are not affected by this far, you know, the food, you know, the food industry, obviously, that's, you know, the supermarkets, the Musgraves, et cetera, they're doing very well. But we're, we've all been hit one way or the other. And so it's, I think that there will be more, I'm hoping there'd be more of an understanding that this is not all about me. You know, it's about them as well. And the very important point here is that, you know, because we're, we're a member of Retail Excellence of Ireland, and I'm getting going to listen to one of their webinars at two o'clock today, is customers, customers need suppliers. And we're, we're actually not a supplier. As Brown Thomas would call us, we're their packaging partners. You know, we're partners. And that has to be understood as well. We all need each other. You know, otherwise, how will business evolve and go around? So we're, we should all be equally important. If somebody's buying from a retailer, the retailer is buying from us. It goes around in circles. We all have to be looking out for each other. And I think I think people have understood that now, that we need to just sit back and think about, you know, who we're buying from, our customer or our supplier. It, you know, I think it's going to be positive, to be honest with you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it sounds, going back to your earlier point, that it's... Um, in a way, COVID may, is actually an opportunity as well in terms of looking at your business and looking at your processes and maybe improving them. Uh, stuff that was left on the long finger for, for many years, uh, you, you now have to look at almost. Yes, but also it's not, it's, you and, well, no, sorry, I speak, I'm speaking to as if I know you don't, but it's years ago, I would be here and only up to recently, this is my office, I'm sitting in my office now and you'd have colleagues coming in and out the door every two seconds, you'd have phone ringing, text messages, WhatsApps, emails, constant, and I mean, I would get about maybe 300 emails a day. You never had time to think. So my only time to think was when I got into the car and was driving to a customer in, in Dublin and you'd have those two or three hours, maybe music in the background, and plus I have five children on top of this. Um, so this time now has given me the most important thing that I never had before, time to think. That pause button, I, I cannot explain how important this has been to me because now my brain is starting to work. It's, there's, the, all the compartments were full of stuff and now they're being emptied. The, the stuff that wasn't important, I just got rid of it. So, and I'm a, I'm a passionate gardener. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in the evenings out cutting lawns and edging and planting and I'm, things are just popping into my head. Ideas are, you know, that thought that we had two years ago, this idea we had, we haven't done that. We must do this. And, and it's, it's just fantastic. I'm loving it. And I, I often wonder where these ideas are coming from. They're coming from somewhere. I think they're coming now back into my head because I now have time. Whereas, you know, this, and we need, this is one thing that I'm going to bring into the company when we're all back again is we need to stop wasting time. 
where we could do, there could be a thread of 50 emails between the three of us. You know, has somebody done this? Would you do that? Whatever it is, instead of shortcutting it and just one, two people have been involved and let's try and finish a job quickly. Too much procrastination. I mean, really, but it's, I, I just, I'm, I have to say I'm loving it. I really am loving part of this. I know this is the wrong thing to say right now, but there's part of COVID-19 that I'm loving because there's time for us now to think and sit back and just ponder and wonder about our companies, where we'll go and what we're going to do. And also, of course, there's a bit of envy because before I went into business, this is what I did do. I was at home cooking, cleaning, uh, cutting lawns, uh, minding my five kids and really, really enjoying it. But anyway, look, if this doesn't work out for JJ2 Limited, I'm going to enter Chelsea Flower Show or maybe MasterChef. I'm not sure I'm going to do one of them. I mean, because we are cooking meals like you've no idea at home and the garden looks amazing. So it's... Um, could be my fallback. Uh, yeah, I have no doubt you'd make a great success of that as well, Vicky. Uh, if you take that radical direction, um, just uh, yeah, another thing actually that strikes me just listening to you is, you know, obviously a lot of people listening, a lot of people generally, they're afraid for their cash flow, the bills coming through the door. Um, listening to you and just your your positive outlook, I suppose, and, and your focus. Um, when I was kind of preparing for this morning, you know, it seemed to me that in terms of fears about cash flow bills, a lot of it is a bit like the some of it is a bit like the Mark Twain quote that the worst things in my life never happened. Um, yeah. You know, as in people go into panic mode, they kind of see the dark tunnel and, you know, in a way that the problem becomes worse through their perspective of the problem um, is, you know, again, uh, would you see that, I suppose, as, as an issue or, um, you know, is there that link, I suppose, between that positive focus and then just getting through things like cash flow and fears about the bills and all of that? I mean, I, I did panic a little bit at the beginning, you know, there was that, how are we, you know, because we're, we're owed a lot of money, there's no question about it. I mean, we have a lot of customers that owe us a lot of money, but I, there was kind of like a five minute panic and then straight away into the, let's get things done mode. So the emails went out to all our customers. We obviously engaged with our banks straight away. And we engaged with all our suppliers as would they help us out. And we, we came up with our cash flow Excel sheet, which really give us the worst case scenario. And we worked in a 13 week phase, the week one to week 13. And we looked at it last night, Margaret and I, and it is a lot better than we thought it would be. So we're paying as we can pay. And we're also getting in a little bit more than we thought we would get in. And, and plus, I suppose 17 of them being furloughed is, 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 is helping as well. But, and I know this is a personal statement, a comment that I'm going to make now, but I was speaking with a, a good friend of mine who has, she's a, she's a, uh, she's, she's director of a very big company in Ireland. And she rang me a few weeks ago on a Saturday night and we both happened to be having a glass of wine at that time. And she said, how are you getting on Vicky? I'm thinking of you. And I said, gosh, you know, I, I, I'm feeling fine. And, you know, I, I thought I wouldn't be sleeping. I thought I'd be terribly worried. And she said, you know, I, I feel similar. And, and we both wondered why. And she said, the reason being is because we both had huge shocks in our lives. So my husband died tragically very, you know, due to depression, which was a massive shock. So I'm used to a shock and I, uh, the worst ever. And also of that fear of, you know, running the business where, where I was, I mean, my big thing when I came in here and I, I never went to college business school and I had a clue what I was doing was that it was all about cost cutting. So I'm very good at that. And managing five children is very good at, you know, when you have to be, you know, when, when you're looking at what's coming in and what's going out. So I have a lot of experience in that. And she also equally, not maybe as dramatic, but she had a lot of issues with one or two things in her personal life. So we were used to this huge scares in our life and huge shocks. And I'm not saying we're immune to it because you are never immune to shocks. But I think it was kind of like, here comes another one that we're going to have to face. And there's only so much you can do. I mean, I can't go into my client's bank accounts and rob them. You know, so you can only do as much as, as not quite, I'm not begging them, but I'm, you know, we're speaking to them and we're engaging them and we're, you know, as much as we can. And I think because our relationship with many has gone on for so many years, um, it does help. But yeah, no, I, I've, this has not been the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. So it's, I'm, that's why I think I'm looking at the positives and looking forward to better things as well, you know, better times and 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and I'm loving all the new, like the exercise I'm getting. I mean, I'm, one of the kids bought me one of these little cheap, well, a like cheap equipment of a Fitbit, which I have over here. And I'm loving all the steps I'm getting in at home in the garden. And I'm, I'm actually taking calls on my phone now because I've got these new pods that they bought me and I could be out gardening and be on a conference call at the same time and nobody knows. It's fantastic. I think it's getting outside of your, you know, doing things differently. Just get away from the, the office, get out, go for walks, open your mind. It, it just, it really does help me to de-stress, definitely. Uh, absolutely. And I, I know, I notice there's a, a few questions coming in, but we might just hold off for a few moments just um, till maybe we get towards half 11, because we do have some time for questions and answers near the end as well. Um, just, I suppose that links nicely, actually, to just your, your last point there about doing things differently and, you know, the way technology is helping us, I suppose. Um, you know, in terms of your marketing, your online presence, your, you know, all of that, I mean, both as it is now and maybe how you see it going forward, has have, have, has that had much of an impact on, on the way you do things at the moment? Oh, yes, huge, absolutely huge. So as I said earlier, one of my colleagues who works, she, she's actually a sales representative, but when she came in, of, she's very similar to me, actually, except she's luckily a lot younger than me. We both have five children. She absolutely adores packaging and she had nothing to do with it until she started here three years ago. But she does a lot of the Instagram and, you know, the, the social media. I mean, I really only did my LinkedIn and that was about it. But I, I did have complete control as to what was going up because there is a particular look that we like going up. And um, But I've taken over social media now. And in fact, a few weeks ago, one of my daughters, Rachel, She's my, she's a solicitor and she decided a moment's time, you need your own Instagram page. So now I have my own little Instagram page going as well with only about, I'd say five followers, but that's more kind of on the garden. But online, our online presence and our social media has absolutely increased hugely since in the last seven weeks. I, I just cannot explain to you how big it's got. And it's because we're maybe putting up the right things and putting up different things, we're working on it. Uh, we're doing a note because I'm working with one graphic designer that's working remotely, Mark, um, and we're, we're both doing it together. And it is really, really, really important. And people said to me years ago when I started the business 15 years ago that connections are so important. I was going, oh, because I remember Fergus saying to me, my late husband, that he connected on the golf course. And I just couldn't quite get this at all. You know, like, how do you connect on the golf course? Connections are so important. LinkedIn never knew how important it was. Anybody who's not on LinkedIn and they're in business need to go on LinkedIn. So I even put up my two J's on the loan. I put a photograph up on it the other day and I don't know, it's about three or 4,000 views on it at this stage. I'm even getting views and likes and connections from people that are in gardening, like serious gardening people. And somebody will link in with you that's linked in with somebody else before they know if they would, you know, if it's somebody who's got a, a boutique, they will look at you. But it, it is, I think Instagram is very important. I didn't think it was important. Now suddenly I've discovered it is really, really important. It is huge. And what we're doing now with the business is that we're trying to drive our business to more online sales. So you know, skipping out all the three or four middle people. So going forward, I mean, obviously there's only one girl now taking sales. You know, she's actually processing the orders and we have somebody then who's picking and sent shipping them out so instead of people ringing up and saying look you know I want to give you an order we're directing them to the online so then we're being paid up front as well which is fantastic that takes another job out of it we're not chasing money but once we get the bespoke packaging up that you can you can actually order that now obviously we, there's about 10,000 different options you could do with bespoke but we're going to do it like you know if you're buying a pair of jeans that you have the option of buying a size 10 12 and 14 in cotton denim whatever it is we're going to flip the basics first with logos and you know something like that so it, it's going to be it is going to drive an awful lot more business through the website and also which means that there's going to be less time being spent on each on individual you know the initially with, you know, if it's a small order, we are looking at, I was looking at, I can see now all the emails coming in. I can see all the orders because all the emails have been, are bouncing into my email um, as well. So I can just see them, an overview. And yesterday alone, there were three customers that ordered over a thousand euros of e-commerce boxes, three. Now, so there's nobody, there's only one person looking after those. Whereas before, we had four people downstairs, you know, doing all the different orders coming through. And then you'd have somebody who'd say, listen, you know, I, I want you to do this and that. And we can do it. a lot of people can do this themselves. They can. Know, I mean, we don't want to lose the customer relationship, the chats, 
the, the one-on-ones, absolutely not. But there's, we can see there's a lot of people that can order, client to clients that can order, and they're quite happy as long as the website is working properly, which it is. We, in the last seven years, seven weeks, sorry, feels like seven years, we have, visually it's much better as well. We've, you know, we've rejigged it so that's easier to buy. So it's like one, two clicks and you're gone, you're, you're there. So yeah, that's very important. So everybody should have a website, should have an opportunity. You know, you do if, if the business is big enough and you, if you have the funds to do it. But I think there is, you can, you can there, are, there is funds out there uh, that you can avail of to, to, to start a website. And we can see now so many businesses, small boutiques that never had a website before now have a website and also have the opportunity have, or giving their clients the opportunity to buy online. Absolutely fantastic, yeah. Um, Sean, um, Sean is our moderator. Sean, if you want to come in at this point with any of the Q&As that have come in to you, um, it would be appreciated. Oh. Okay, um, basically, sorry about that. Now, okay, John, Vicky, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, the, there's a serious amount of feedback coming in. Everybody's enjoying this interview and are delighted with your interview and barrister skills, John, and extracted from Vicky some nuggets of gold that everybody can go away with. Now, the first bit of feedback is, is they just like to say that some people are saying, Vicky, they're delighted you didn't do the piano course. <laughs> because if you did, we wouldn't be able to hear, they wouldn't be able to hear the sweet, mu the music that's sweet to their ears this morning on how to run your business. Wow. Now, <laughs> having said that, back down to practical stuff, Here's John McLaughlin. He enjoyed the presentation and loves the positivity. He says, when looking at every facet of the business, how do you approach it? He says, because he finds his head is full 24 seven of areas he needs to look at. And he's wondering, do you have a structure on how to deal with all these thoughts that are bubbling in your mind just to basically get some clarity? So no, what I do is I'm a great person for writing things down. So the second I think of something, I write it down. In fact, I don't write it down. I actually email it back to myself. That's how bad I am. I'm a list woman. But I write things down, but we can't do everything. And what I just, I, I, we, we have these meetings, the team meetings that I talked about, Microsoft team meetings, they are amazing. We thankfully started those before COVID started. So now I can speak to all the, my colleagues, like the head of finance, the purchasing manager, uh, my right-hand girl, she's an amazing girl, Lindsay, and uh, there could be one or two others on at the same time. And we talk every week about where, what we did. One person will always take the notes, and Lindsay usually, because she's the best, she takes the notes. And we talk about all the areas that we've got problems with. What are we coming up against? What my thoughts are, what I was thinking of, what we should address for the following week. So we've had a weekly meeting, which goes on every Monday, maybe for about an hour and a half. Sometimes I have to remember to run upstairs and brush my hair and maybe take off my dressing gown and come back downstairs again because I forget that I'm actually being watched. But that's how we do it. And we, we so the, the graphic designer, he's got a big long list. I, mean, I actually sent him a list last night, a follow up list. And I said, look, you know, we spoke about Mark, about these seven things. Maybe you can get at those for today and tomorrow. So there's lots of lists. So you can't do everything together. But even if you could get five of your hundred things done, let's say today, and then the next five done tomorrow. And I'm sure there'd be another five added to it. But at least if you can see progress and say tick, 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 tick. I think you feel, I always feel great when I've achieved something. And it's, you know, with my five children, I have, most of them are high achievers. Um, the, the, you know, there's one or two maybe that not. But, you know, you can see the lazier ones to the, to, to the other ones that are high achievers. And the difference between them is that some don't care if they, ticked 10 different things on one day and if or if they ticked none so I was saying to one of them the other day who I thought kind of you know I'm, he, he's kind of just finished his FE once I said Mark you know maybe getting out of bed at 12 instead of you know three in the afternoon might be better and he was like, oh no mom and you see I was explaining to him that I love a day where I'm pro productive and I think that's what it's about isn't it it doesn't matter if I have a bad day at work well it does I prefer to have a good day but when I go home and feel that I've, I've I got all those jobs out of the way and I've done my best and even you feel so much better, but you won't get all of them out of the way for the moment because there is so much. So I think one by one by one, just tick them. So you tick them and finish them and close the box, and move on to the next one instead of half doing them. And we have I have this expression, these six words that I think are easy to remember, which I do sometimes in presentations. And it's just see it, do it, finish it. 
And, you know, we can all procrastinate. I'm a procrastinator as well. And we will see it, we'll do it, but we never kind of finish it. And it's funny that I'm thinking of these six words now, because as I said earlier, it was my birthday on Sunday. And I'm very lucky to have a housekeeper. She's not actually a housekeeper. She's a friend of, our, of the family's. I miss her greatly, let me tell you, for the moment. But she dropped a gift in of a cheese board, sorry, a chopping board. And on it, she has saw it, did it, finished it in the past tense. And I think if you see, just remember those six words, see it, do it, finish it. And where I heard those words were years and years and years ago. I can't remember the CEO of some company in the UK. And remember, they were having the Olympics in London. This is how long ago this yeah. is. And he was saying, you know, we are so bad at finishing things here, but the one thing we have to be ready for is the Olympics because we're given a date. So they couldn't kind of half have the roads ready, half have the train stations ready, the tubes and everything else. They were given a date, so they had to finish it on, before that date. So I think you need to give yourself a date. So say, let's say by the 20th of May, I want to finish this project. And um, so see it, do it, finish it. Okay, thank you very much. There's one question for John. There's there's a there's a big long, a big rush by everybody to get into social media and go online, which is the way a lot of businesses will have to go. And we're just wondering, is there any particular legal or HR type things people should keep in mind when they're getting up on online or social media for the first time? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit like don't mention the war to some yeah. degree. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, our legal system wouldn't be renowned as being at the most cutting edge of um, developments, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the way our, it's quite, you know, traditional and, you know, it, technology, um, even now, despite the fact, you know, internet is around 20, 30 years in terms of business, but, you know, you'd be surprised still by the lack of clarity in many areas of law, HR around um, social media. And to be honest, on top of that, it'll be really interesting to see how maybe remote working, online working impacts on the law that is already there. I'll give you an example. Last year, for example, the, one of the courts said that um, if an employer is emailing his workers outside of working hours, that, in, you know, in, in theory could actually be a grounds for a breach of contract or um, dismissal. Uh, constructive dismissal, resignation. Um, so, you know, now that we're all working from home and that flexibility, that fluidity about where work ends and private life begins is there, um, you know, it, 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 it's something that people should be conscious of that's still there as an issue in terms of remote working. But it'll also be interesting to see how maybe, you know, depending how long this process continues, this period we're in continues, whether the courts might evolve that essentially to cut businesses a little bit of slack about, you know, um, that kind of flexibility that's there in the system now because of remote working and because of this, the, you know, the, 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 the climate we're in. But again, just, I suppose, on the social media side in particular, both the, I suppose it, that would, I suppose it kicks in on two fronts, either the social media front internal to the business and I suppose social media, as Vicky was um, so eloquently explaining to us in terms of marketing and online and digital connections with customers. And I suppose in terms of the internal to the business, the workers, the, you know, or even yourself, even if you're a one person operation, a sole trader, it doesn't have to be a big business or, you know, employment situation. It can just be yourself even just in terms of I suppose, um, uh, again, uh, the issues around um, having a, a policy about your social media use. Every business now should have a social media policy in terms of, um, you know, uh, if you have a, a small number of staff, um, who owns uh, who has property rights over business, over issues belonging to the business through that social media. So, for example, again, and this was happening before COVID-19, if people are engaging, for example, through, you know, if, if, if Facebook or uh, Instagram or whatever it is, is a method by which you, you know, have that brand attraction, um, you know, if the, the customer likes a particular person and they're engaging with a person through social media. If there's a parting of the ways, who actually owns that customer? If, you know, in terms of the business, um, 
you know, I suppose, property or the goodwill. And um, essentially, there's no answer to that. Essentially, that's up for businesses to tailor. Uh, the policies, you know, around these issues have to be basically built into the contracts of workers, um, uh, you know, it's so that there's clarity involved. And I suppose it's it's, it's basically linking back to the team that uh, Vicky was explaining to us about taking the time now to look at your procedures, up to, you know, look at your processes, you know, all those things that were maybe we weren't able to focus on, you know, previously should now be looked at. And, and just very quickly, I'll stop on this, but very quickly, just around data protection and uh, privacy, that again is, 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 is important. Um, and and, you know, with more online business, again, everyone might remember two years ago, we got all, you know, presumably some of the businesses here listing were actually um, involved with this as well. But certainly um, in terms of um, the data that you have on customers, um, that has to be very, very carefully controlled and monitored. And, you know, with the new GDPR um there's huge sanctions now, depending on the type of data and the type of breach. Um, and obviously that's there now two years in the system. But again, with the new online, uh, I suppose, structures or the new online engagements, that's something just to keep watch of, you know, keep monitor, uh, uh, keep under monitor, under supervision and, uh, and your systems as well. But that's something you could look at, you know, uh, you know uh, I suppose more specifically, but overall in terms of the terrain of social media online activity, whether it's marketing or employment, or whatever, um, those would be the general pitfalls to watch out for, yeah. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for that, John. Uh, now, just some more comments here. Um, Vicky, this is for you from Margaret. Love today's session. Vicky, you are, an, you are inspiring and honest. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I will follow you on Instagram. You yeah. now have 64 followers. Yeah. So... Just, um, are we happy to go on with the Q and A now, or do you do you need to go back to something to cover on your presentation? No, I, I think I think it's good. We we'll go on with the Q and A, Sean, if that's all okay, right. Okay, that's just, just I, checking. Could I, could I just interject for a second? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Just before, in case we finish this and I don't get to it, um, I, I there were just two things I wanted to read out, and which may be which may help with with all of us staying strong and kind of positive vibes, but. One of them that I came across actually, and I, I did put it up on Instagram as I was learning how to use the whole thing was that, and I think everybody needs to remember this is that particularly those that are really feeling that things are really tough is that anyone can give up. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, but to hold it together when everyone else would understand if you fell, would understand if you fell apart. Uh, so holding it together when everyone else could understand if you fell apart, I think that's so important and you need to understand, we all need to understand that it's really, really difficult at the moment. So, you know, people would understand if we give up, but, you know, if you keep going and it's amazing what we think is could be having a really bad day today, something really good might happen tomorrow. So keep at it. But uh, something I always use for my PowerPoint presentations, and I think this is important as well for all of us, is the three pills that every leader should take. Um, and this particularly is important right now. The first one is stillness. It, cur it cures unbridled enthusiasm. And like, if you think about when was the last time that we actually paused during ever. So COVID-19 is actually giving us that fantastic time to pause with no meetings, phones constantly ringing. So stillness allows for information to be absorbed. And that is what I was talking about earlier, that you know things were a little bit less crazy with doors opening and phones ringing and emails. So the first pill is stillness. The second one is silence. Uh, it Saying nothing sometimes says the most and it cures foot and mouth disease, which was something that I pulled out of. That's the second pill. And the third one is solitude, which cures chronic burnout. Solitude promotes reflection and introspection. So those three pills, stillness, silence and solitude, we didn't know that we were going to be given these um, seven weeks ago, but we have been given an opportunity now. It, it, it's arrived on our lap, and I think we should use those three, take those three pills daily. And that is why I think my brain is thinking differently and has become more creative than it had been in previous to that. And, um, you know, it's always, it's always been there, but it just needed to get back out again. And I think just, you know, to sit back, relax and start, you know, those, just those three pills. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much, Vicky. That's actually serious food for thought. Uh, definitely, I think that's brilliant. Now, coming to the questions and comments as they came in, this is from Mick Whelan in Cork, where he says, good morning from Cork. 
Mick is, runs MW Safety Services. Great to hear from Vicky and how the company has diversified. There will be a lot of diversification in the future. Hopefully there will be more SMEs pop up in the future and we as a nation and fellow business owners can support them. Well done and look outside the box. Um, basically from Dan Mulcahy. Hi Vicky, very interesting interview. Have your suppliers in general been looking for price increases or what have conversations been like? So we have hundreds of suppliers and they range, they come from many, the whole way from China, India, Vietnam, Europe, UK, down the road, basically. So it, we, and they're all supplying different types of products. So we go from the luxury packaging down to the, the, the twist economy packaging bags, everything we're doing from the toilet for, as somebody said to me, I interviewed somebody years and years ago, he was such a lovely gentleman coming for a sales rep job here in Midwest of Ireland, or Limerick. And he, I had him in the boardroom and he looked around and he said, now he, he'd, he'd kind of hands that I like, you know, there were kind of, you could see he was now to a person like I am. You know, so he, he's a big, you know, I'd be useless at selling all this beautiful, sexy packaging here, but I'd be your man for industrial silo wrap and toilet rolls. So we do. <laughs> yep. So we, now, I, 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 he didn't get the job, but anyway, because it was, it was, it was the sexiest job I wanted him to sell. But he basically, he actually said it as he, as, as we, we sell from the basic toilet roll up to the sexy, beautiful, selfless packaging. So we have different suppliers. So no, we haven't seen any price increases. Um, but what we have seen is we have a big problem with uh, deliveries out of China for the moment because of the freight. Like there is like air freight for the moment is just it's 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 extraordinary. We can't get air freight out of China. It's because there's a queue, and normally we wouldn't be air freighting. We would be sea freighting. But there's a big problem there. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, no, we're fine. We don't see any increases. I certainly wouldn't be taking an increase for the moment. I, I, I would definitely wouldn't because I'm not passing on an increase. And the other thing we're doing, and this makes me sound like it's Mother Teresa, which I'm furthest thing from it, but um, with face masks, for instance, and I have one here, we knew nothing about face masks at the beginning, but now we're buying them. And I do, the one thing we're not doing is increasing inflating prices of anything because I've seen it happening okay. down the road, not very far from here. People are buying face masks that never bought face masks before. Now we have the time and the ability to be able to to be able to do a market research to see what face masks should be sold for. But there are people doubling, tripling, quadrupling prices, and it really annoys me. It's like, you know, the good old times when Limerick, which I am no doubt we'll be there next year again. We're up in Stoke Park, winning the All Ireland. <laughs> My absolute favourite team. Of the whole Love Ireland. We will be back. But you know, with all the hotels suddenly double, triple, quadruple their prices, yes. hotel rooms. Now, I, I just cannot understand why people would do that. We won't be doing it. And if if anybody wants to take this as an opportunity to make money, I, I I'm just not going to engage in any form, shape. Very good. What I didn't say at the beginning is that John is from Kilkenny. He may have a different That's view right, on, yeah. on what's happening, you know. <laughs> sure, John, your day is hurt. Your day is over. Yeah. Yeah. That, you that'll be the, that, that'll be the cliffhanger we drop as we come to an end. Of yeah, yeah no. 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 It's over. More questions. It looks like you struck a chord. Here's a message from Berna, where Berna says she started an SME company just before the quarantine. She says, I have to say a lot of people I need to call an email can be quite curt. Mm. I think they are under the impression that I am quite mad to be trying to set up a business in the current situation. I have to agree that respect in all aspects of business needs to be pushed. I won't be turned. I will keep going, even though I, like you, have five children from third class to leave in certificate. It's great to hear your, your spin on the positives of this break in, in, at the moment. Thank you for your passion and honesty and your little gems of wisdom, Berna. Do you have anything more to say just on the respect thing, which I think has resonated with everybody? Oh, I, I think it's, it's like respect is, has to be key. It's, 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 it has to be key now. I mean, with me, I'll tell you, for my colleagues, I often wonder what my colleagues would say about me if they were asked, but I am half German. So I, you know, there is that little slightly bubbly, volatile, you know, little bit of blood going on in my body at times, which, you know, I need to kind of suppress it. So there are times where I want to tell somebody to, you know, whatever, but I don't, because at the end of the day, it's, it's our, 
it's our company that I, I want people to to respect our company, to respect all of us. And we, like, you know, you, you, people should respect each other the way they want people to respect them. Isn't that right? And regarding our heart is speaking about, you know, think people think she, maybe she's mad starting a business. You know, there is nothing better, I think, in life. Is there anything better than doing something when people tell you you can't do it? Is there anything better? Now, so I love when people tell me, you're not going to be able to do that. It actually drives me crazy because then I will go out and do it. Now, I mean, there's some things I won't be able to do, like, you know, maybe upscale up the side of a cliff or something like that. But there is a, a little tiny story, which I'll tell you very, very quickly. And I think this might explain me in the best way. But when I was young, many moons ago, I was in boarding school and we were shipped off to deported to Wicklow. And we, I was quite young when I was in first year. I was 11 and a half when I started. And... Mrs. Brangan, I will never forget her. She was my English teacher and she gave us all a project to do. And I decided I would do it on Tutankhamen, the pyramid in Egypt. And she turned around to me. I can still see her. She said, no, Vicky, you won't be able to do that. It's too difficult. And I remember looking up in there. No, I'm going to do this. And I did it. In, I still have it. It's here in my office, uh, the project. And I got an A plus for it. And I went to so much trouble. And I remember the colouring pencils and I was blending them with my finger. And it was a beautiful. I did a poem dedicated to my parents. But it drove me nuts that she told me that I couldn't do it. And I think that is, and that's a lot of business people are like that. When people say, no, you're not going to be able to do it. I think it's because a lot of them don't want you to do it. You know, they really don't want you to do it. So I just go out and I do it. Um, but some things I do, I don't even know how I do it. And then you look back at the God, was that me or was that somebody else? Or how did I have that thought? Where did that come from? But you know, I really do sometimes think it's somebody else. You know, when I come out of a meeting, I'm nervous, by the way, for every meeting I do. I was terribly nervous before this. I took okay. a spray of rescue remedy. But every time I finish something and I push myself, you know, if I do something that I, I it's not in my kind of normal thing that I would do, it's kind of out of my comfort zone. It makes you feel better at the end of the day if you are successful. I think that's what it is. And isn't it better to try than never to know? Absolutely. Excellent. Now, the questions and comments are coming in thick and fast. Today's, this is from a Simon. Today's session is fantastic. Thank you, everyone. With today's team about how to protect the business and its people, my question is on succession planning. Now, I don't know, obviously, you don't have to share them, but what's your thoughts and what's your sharings on that, Vicky? This is hilarious. This, you know, this is just hilarious, this one. I mean, I shouldn't even be laughing. But so... Behind me, I don't know if people can see it, but there are the three generations. Yeah, absolutely, of yeah. We've got the founder, John, and then his son, who's my late father, okay. Jack, and my late husband, Richard Gear, looking like Fergus here behind me. And I have five children, and the eldest is a nurse. Uh, the next girl is Rachel Slister, JJ, I'll talk about him in a minute. Um, and then there's Mark, who is doing law, and there's Philip, who is my favourite child in the entire world. And I can say it now with you because I said it on um, Ryan Tuberty live and radio and recently not realising it. So the whole world now knows that Philip is my favourite child. He's studying actuary in UCD. Anyway, we'll go back to JJ. So when JJ was my eldest son and when he was tiny, he would pass by. Now I wasn't in business then. He would pass by Fergus's office and he would go. He couldn't even talk and he would go, me? He'd see the sign, JJ. It was like it was already his as far as he was concerned. He was going to be the fourth generation. And growing up, he always talked about he would go into the business. And then I suppose when Fergus died, it was 10 years ago this July, the suddenly the succession was a big thing on my it, it was taking up a lot of my time thinking about what was I going to do? Because I don't want to do this every day. You know, as much as I love it, I you know, I have other plans. Okay. Um, other plans. So JJ did a, um, he, you know, he, he did a business degree course and a master's in finance and flying along. And one day he, we had a bit of a problem here with the, with the next colleague, uh, you know, trying to find somebody supposed to step into Ferguson's shoes, the general manager. And I rang JJ, who was in aviation leasing, and I said, JJ, this is your chance. It's now or never. I mean, I didn't want him to come in in ten years' time. And I mean, you know, he was twenty six at the time. So anyway, he uprooted himself from Dublin. He came down here. He was always interested in the business. He always asked me, Mum, how everything is going. If he saw the dollar weakening or strengthening, he'd always send me a text. Mum, you need to buy, you need to sell, whatever it was. So down he came. And he had been here before. You know, he'd be helping emptying the containers and stuff. He lasted nine months. And I knew, and JJ knew, I'd say, 
nine days in, it wasn't going to be long lasting because he didn't have the passion. And he was used to buying planes. Big difference between buying paper bags, let me tell you. And he was coming from Dublin, you know, you know, fast moving, all his friends up there. Now, I mean, he could change his mind in five or 10 years time. But people said after us, God, Vicky, you must be really disappointed. I wasn't a bit disappointed. And the reason I wasn't is that I would never, and this is a, a, this is a conversation I have with many family uh, businesses and, and CEOs, I would never put somebody in a situation that they didn't enjoy doing for the rest of their lives. Why would you? And now the other thing I've often asked about is the passion I have for the business because apparently it exudes out of me. I want to be really clear about this. I am not passionate about a lot of the things in this business. HR, um, the finance end of it, the margin, all of this. I'm really passionate about being creative and you know, speaking to customers and, you know, all those kind of lovely parts of the business. But I've explained this to people a few times. It, like nobody is going to be passionate about 100% of, of their business. I mean, I mean, I'd like to meet somebody that actually is. But my second eldest, who is now a solicitor, she got a scholarship to go to UCG when she finished her leaving. And I will never forget her ringing me and saying, Mom, you know, I just hate this and I hate law and all my friends here are so passionate about arts and medicine and this and that. And I said, Rachel, you know, you can't be passionate about all of your course. Anyway, long story short, she jumped ship and went to UCC and I gave her one U-turn. And I always give my kids one giant U-turn, but only one, not a hundred. Otherwise, they'd meander forever. And she started law again because she was very young. And she said, Mom, I want to go to Cork. And my friends are down there. So she did. Three months later, she rings crying again, Mom, I just, you know, I'm just not passionate about it. My friend is so passionate. And I made her stick with it at that point. And I said, Rachel, when you get older, you will understand that nobody's 100% passionate about everything. So anyway, she's now a fine solicitor. But I know that she, like, I think she was watching too much of VR at the time, to be quite honest with you. But it's it's like everything. This part, and so I think what you need to do is do the horrible things first. I tend to do the nice things first. That's where I get it all wrong. I dive into my emails, go back to the people that I need to get back to, kind of check all my production samples, design a few things on a pad. And then I get to the really horrible things. And I do this every single time. It's a shocker. But 100% you cannot be passionate about your business every day right. and about every sector, every part of it. Okay. Thanks a million for that, Vicky. John, I think most of our audience would like, to, including Simon, who asked the question, would like to take advantage of some free legal advice from an expert. Oh. Have you anything to say on what kind of legal pitfalls or things you should out, look out for in terms of if you have to come up with a succession plan quickly? Uh, well, um, I suppose, I mean, like I, generally it, it relates to any type of, I suppose, structural uh, uh, position. It, it really involves, I, I suppose, being very careful about uh, legally, contractually, who is being appointed. You know, there's issues around equality legislation. There's issues around, um, you, you know, the contractual terms. Um, you know, it's, again, just in terms of property issues, um, um, you know, one of the things, and Vicky kind of touched on it there, but, you know, generally speaking, um, you, you know, there's issues around restrictive covenants and property that if, if, you know, if a succession plan is put in place and it doesn't work out, what contingencies have you built for that? Um, you know, have you have you protected the business in that scenario uh, in terms of a range of, you know, property issues, you know, rest restrictive covenants, confidential information, uh, you know, property rights over the, the, the you know, the, the supplies and the, the nuts and bolts of the business. Th those will be generally legal issues in that type of context. Thanks a million. Uh, now, just one of the things, there's a massive amount of people coming in wanting to contact you, Vicky. I know how to contact you. Could you give out your Instagram contact details so that your fan base will increase dramatically within the hour? <laughs> well, they, 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 I don't even know. It's, it's so new to me. There is an Instagram. If you just Google JJO2 Limited, you'll see the Instagram. And my own personal Instagram is, um, uh, I was known as, my, my siblings called me Tola when I was growing up, not Vicky. So I'm Tola O'Toole. So I think I'm the only Tola O'Toole out there. Okay. I'm actually waiting for Jared Gavin to actually follow me because, <laughs> you know, well, jokes aside, he is a virtual twin of mine. So he linked in with me back to how important LinkedIn is. He was here about three or four years ago and chatting about whatever. I think he linked in with me and then I, I obviously connected. And he is born same day, same month, same year. He okay. jumped. 
that I came out first, so I'm the older twin. But um, so when I started my, <laughs> when Rachel started my, or logged me in to start my Instagram page, uh, I kind of wished him a happy, he sent me an email to wish me a happy birthday. And then I kind of did put up a beautiful garden post and I tagged him in it. Nothing still hasn't followed me, but I'm waiting. It's a matter of time, a matter of time. But it's it's more garden and house, my, my personal Instagram. And I think I've only put up about seven posts. Okay, very good. I I do believe you're going to have to get, uh, you'll be getting a lot more from here after this event. Oh. The other thing I just is, is that, uh, and I just might like your thoughts on it, Vicky, because we'll have to go f- finish up fairly soon. It's a suggestion that Ryan Howard has made that maybe something for Chambers Ireland to survey Irish businesses to determine new opportunities for new business to develop as suppliers to other Irish businesses. I think, Vicky, you've struck, you've, you're, you've struck a chord there and it resonates that as a nation of consumers and businesses, I think we'd all like to see each other thrive and circulate in the new environment. Yeah. Is there any, have you any views on that? Uh, no, yes, I do. But I, I think, you know, all everybody kind of helping each other out is the most important thing. So buying from each other, supporting each other, no matter what, you know, where you can, obviously. Can I, is, is that, that's what you're asking about? Yes, it? yes, yes, that's now, it, yeah. Just yeah. an example, and going back again to connections and connectivity and all the importance of all of this. So when you are a EY finalist, and it doesn't matter if you win or if you don't win, you know automatically you're an alumni. And like I said, I can't keep up. So we have three WhatsApp groups. So there's the West of Ireland group. There is the ladies, the girls group, and there's the generic group. I presume the boys have one as well. So you see all these amazingly famous people that you only read about, and you kind of I wonder, is that he or is that she? But the amount of EY alumni that have bought from me is extraordinary mm. since being a finest, and particularly recently, gloves, all sorts of things. So we are, like for Trump Chambra, you know, the whiskey and the gin and all yeah. that. They're the, like Patrick needs an amazing guy. He yeah. buys all his packaging from us. So it's trying, and, and they did say to the beginning, let's all try and support each other here, because some yeah. of those that alumni have been hugely affected you know huge i mean because i think if you're going to fall the bigger the company you are the fall is obviously steeper but helping each other out where we can see an opportunity to buy from each other yeah. is amazing absolutely yeah. is amazing yeah. and even yesterday so there's some uh, drinks company off license i i think because i'm now getting all the marketing at jgo tool emails to send into my email address i'm getting all these newsletters so there was an off license i kept sending every day these newsletters and i was going oh so anyway, I went back to them and said, hi, just wondering, do you need packaging? And they came back, do you need wine? And I said, no, it was my birthday on Sunday, I got loads of wine. But they, I think they're going to buy packaging from us now because they emailed me this morning to say, we didn't realise you were around and we want to buy from the Ireland instead of the UK. So, okay. Fantastic. Brilliant. Now, we've nearly come to the end of the time. Uh, for the questions that haven't been answered, um, I think, Michael, we can arrange that they will be answered later. But for the moment, I'd like to thank you, Vicky and John, for an absolutely excellent masterclass of an interview. And I'll pass you back to Michael, who will basically um, take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was a breath of fresh air. The feedback has been so positive. So Vicky and John, thank you so much for that. And uh, yes, if, if you have any questions that um, you would like to ask, um, please feel free to email myself and Geraldine and uh, we can we can handle those, no problem. Um, so yeah, very jam-packed session, lots of really interesting insight today. Um, I hope you've been following on social media as well using the hashtag Reboot2020. We really appreciate all of your feedback and we'll share your stories and your posts as well. Our uh, social media team are looking at that at the moment. So um, with that said, I'd just like to thank everyone from joining us today. Thank you to all the businesses that are part of Chambers Ireland. We're delighted to be running this series in association with Chambers Ireland. And uh, it's coming to you from Griffith College, Dublin, Cork and Limerick. So uh, today was Sean Martins from uh, Griffith College, Dublin. And uh, thank you so much, Sean, as well. And thank you to the rest of the team as well that are working on this project. Um, Really great. We have a session tomorrow, which you might have seen in the emails, which is going to be about banking. And that's going to be at 10 a.m. So we would look, we look forward to welcoming you there. And that will be a slightly shorter session and uh, we will have Q&A during that as well. So I hope that you had lots of notes written in your workbook today and uh, that you'll take inspiration from today. So 
with that said, nothing more to say, only thank you so much to our speakers today for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we will see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And stay safe and well and enjoy the day. Thanks also to Sinead as well for uh, managing the Q&A in the background. We had a lot today. So take care, everyone. Thank you very much.